Okay, I don't know what happened before, but this is part four of my lecture on prostitution in the 19th century. And I was talking about this situation in the Storyville section of New Orleans. If you, if you were coming to New Orleans as a tourist or as a man on business, uh, it would, you would be, have to be a man in order for this to happen to you. In the railway station, you would be given a little booklet, a little free booklet, which would tell all about the brothels in Storyville. And it would say, you know, some of these brothels would advertise and say, we've got octoroon ladies and the, you know how wonderful they are. And blah, blah, blah. So there was this kind of uh, commercialization of one's racial status based on the idea that while you were going to bed with somebody who was mostly white, they had this black component in their genetic nature that brought that sexuality that black men and women were stereotyped as having. And of course, people also regarded this as a, a sexual activity that was crossing the color line. Even though the octoroon might be very light skinned, it was still considered that a white man was having sex with a black woman and that was considered to be socially improper. It certainly would have been socially improper for the white man to marry the octoroon. It was still socially improper for him to have sex with the octoroon. But um, that somehow added a little bit of spice to the situation, perhaps. Um, but it also sort of laid the groundwork for the end of Storyville. Uh, Storyville came, was abolished as a red light district in 1917. And it was a sort of a two-part situation, which I find interesting. First, uh, by the beginning of the 20th century, you had had this institutionalization of segregation uh, beginning. There were laws that were being passed. The, one of the famous Supreme Court cases that took place uh, in 1896 was the Supreme Court case of Plessy versus Ferguson, uh, in which a New Orleans man of mixed race Homer Plessy was denied the opportunity to ride in a particular car of a streetcar because he was considered colored. And uh, the Supreme Court decided that it was perfectly okay for him to be denied the opportunity to ride in this particular streetcar because there was another streetcar uh, that he could ride in which was just the same. Uh, the fact that he was being racially discriminated against was not taken into consideration by the Supreme Court. And this is where you get the idea of separate but equal that most people are familiar with from the, the civil rights cases of the 1950s and 1960s, uh, which overturned Plessy versus Ferguson and declared that separate but equal was not a legitimate reason or justification for discrimination. Um, but in 1917, uh, people who were trying to enforce this separation of the races, uh, were very disturbed at the idea that it would be possible for white men to go to bed with or have sex with women who classified as black. So at the beginning of 1917, in January, um, it was declared that Storyville would be divided into two parts. Actually, it had already been existed in two separate units, which were separated by a few city blocks that were not part of the prostitution district. But at this point, it was declared that the northern section would be only for black prostitutes and black customers. And the southern area would be only for white prostitutes and white customers. And if a white man was caught going into the black neighborhood, he would be prosecuted uh, because white men were not supposed to have sex with black women. And since this had been one of the main justifications for uh, Storyville in the first place, it was a place where white men could go to have sex with black women, um, a lot of people found this disturbing. Um, and who knows what would have happened if, um, here's a, my little chart explaining what happens in Storyville at the beginning of 1917. But uh, another thing that's going on in 1917 is that America, the United States, enters into the First World War um, in April of 1917. And there was a very swift, uh, energetic mobilization process. And one of the things that the government was disturbed about, was trying to prevent from happening, was that in military exercises of previous years, uh, in, in particular, uh, a situation in 1916 where the 
uh, United States Army had gone down to the border between Texas and Mexico uh, to suppress the uh, activities of Pancho Villa, who was part of a Mexican revolution that was then, then taking place. One of the things that the army officers discovered was that um, very quickly, communities of prostitutes and bars and brothels would form around the uh, army camp because this, these guys were away from their wives and girlfriends and it was considered that they were fair game and they certainly provided lucrative uh, opportunities for the, the bars and brothels. So the uh, government was determined that this was not going to happen in the training camps that were being set up for the uh, draftees. The World War I was the first time since the Civil War that uh, the draft had been instituted. And uh, they drove away the red light districts and, and caused uh, city governments to close them down. Um, one of the justifications that was interesting for doing this was that they thought that the soldiers would get um, venereal diseases such as syphilis and gonorrhea <clears throat> and we had to keep our boys in physical shape so that they would be able to go to Europe and fight uh, in a, an effective way. <clears throat> um, why they were picking on prostitutes in particular is an interesting question. I mean, for instance, for, for one thing, the prostitutes had been infected by men. Prostitutes don't spontaneously generate syphilis and gonorrhea in their bodies. But the prostitutes were already considered to be non-respectable citizens. It was considered to be sort of okay to pick on them and to blame them for the spread of syphilis and gonorrhea. And not only were the red light districts closed down in practically every city in the United States, uh, but the prostitutes were arrested in huge numbers, and they were not given their civil rights in the process of that, because technically they were not being arrested. The idea was that if you, if you suspected somebody of carrying syphilis or gonorrhea, the United States government had the right to uh, detain you and put you in a uh, sort of a holding you, you would be put into quarantine, technically speaking, uh, while it was determined first whether you had gonorrhea or syphilis. And secondly, if it was determined that you did have gonorrhea or syphilis, you would be treated for this disease before being released into the population. Um, if you were detained and it was discovered that you did not uh, have syphilis or gonorrhea, you would still be released eventually, but it, that didn't mean you wouldn't be quarantined. And what happens is that a lot of women end up spending time in prison without actually having been accused of any crime. I mean, the only thing that they are being held in prison for is on suspicion that they might have syphilis or gonorrhea. Um, if they are, if it, it turns out that they don't, they will be released, but they will still have done time in prison. Uh, a lot of people said that there should be places set up that work quite so much like prisons for these people to be quarantined in, but there were so many prostitutes being arrested that there was really no place to put all of them. Um, and of course, the ones who were uh, determined to have syphilis or gonorrhea would be held whether or not they had been convicted of the crime of prostitution. Um, in fact, the process of quarantine and treatment took place before a trial ever happened. So these women were being held in these prisons and prison-like facilities uh, simply because some government official wanted to find out whether they had gonorrhea or syphilis and then cure them of that before letting them loose, presumably to uh, continue their uh, career of prostitution. Or if they had never been prostitutes, they, they would just go back to their regular lives. And, you know, the, you look at the records and you realize that a lot of the people who were picked up on suspicion of having syphilis and gonorrhea were just people who were members of the working class. Um, certainly no rich person would be arrested and uh, tested for gonorrhea or syphilis and treated um, because it was assumed that this was something that bad people were giving to good people. Um, so the 
uh, people who were being arrested were people who really had no way of defending themselves. I mean, you, you uh, to connect back to something I talked about earlier in the lecture, these women who were going to the dance halls and getting involved with men were not technically speaking prostitutes. That's not what they were doing for a living, but they were behaving in a way that upper class society did not consider to be appropriate and therefore they were just as guilty as the people were who had set up shop in a brothel or something like that and they and the under the message although it was never specifically stated in this way was that these were people who deserved to be held in detention or something like that whether or not they were legally defined as having committed a crime they were people who were not respectable women and they should be punished in some way for doing that. And the, you, you have to suspect that the uh, idea that they were being detained for having, for being suspected of having syphilis and gonorrhea was in a way a convenient excuse. These people were being controlled because the ones in power thought that these were people who shouldn't be allowed to run around and, and do whatever they wanted to do. Um, this is an interesting, especially Today, as we are dealing with uh, the situation of coronavirus, um, the idea that governments can step in and control the whereabouts of people and the things that they are able to do and not to do based on the suspicion that they might have a disease or they might be in danger of contracting a disease is, a, is one that we are discussing right now. I mean, even today, I saw something on the television about there being a news report that people in Michigan are, you know, invading the state house. Armed men are bringing guns into the state house because they don't think they're, um, they, they think their civil rights are being violated by governments passing laws saying that they have to behave in certain ways. Now, the justification that the governments have is that they are trying to control the spread of disease. And in this case, it may be perfectly true. I'm sure, I, in fact, I'm sure it is perfectly true that they are trying to control disease. But the underlying question um, as to whether the government can control a person's activities based on the idea that they, they are suspected of carrying a disease is called into question, I think, by this episode of controlling prostitution during World War I because um, the idea that the putting the prostitutes into internment camps basically uh, and, and detaining them under quarantine until they could be treated and cured uh, was not something that people were um, executing in an equitable fashion. These were people who were being discriminated against because they were in certain social classes and, and located in certain ways. Interestingly enough, by the way, the internment of, and the detention of prostitutes didn't do anything to affect the rate of infection of syphilis and gonorrhea. Uh, the soldiers went on catching and in fact, some of them had gone into the army with syphilis and gonorrhea. So their uh, patronization of prostitutes outside the training camp had nothing to do with the fact that they were in infected with syphilis and gonorrhea. This was a means of social control. And uh, whether or not this is something that's taking place today in connection with coronavirus is a legitimate question to be raised. And it has, you know, it has to be based, uh, examined based on the facts, but uh, it continues to be a question as to the extent to which a government can impose on people's freedom in order to control disease. Not because that's a bad idea. Um, I think it can be a good idea, but it has been used in wrong ways. I think it was used in wrong ways to control the prostitutes or the people who were suspected of being prostitutes during World War I. So, during American participation in World War I. That's the ideas, those are the ideas that I have in connection with prostitution. And uh, I will try and get together another lecture for you before too long, and I hope I won't be coughing so much. See you soon. Bye.